Howdy, y'all. I'm Dr. Sure. Jarvis. We have with us Dr. Jeff Tremonte. He is one of our neurologists at Scott & White in Round Rock. I've had the pleasure of working with Dr. Tremonte for the past, uh, geez, five, six, almost seven years now. And uh, he is um, actively involved in our neurology program uh, as well as our stroke program. And he's going to talk to us about some of the things that the questions that keep coming up uh, taking care of stroke folks. So, Dr. Tremonte, thank you very much for coming. I really appreciate you helping us. Uh, if you don't mind, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got to be here? Sure. Thank you, Dr. Jarvis. So, again, my name is Jeff Tremonte, and uh, for a long time I've been the neurologist here at Scott & White Round Rock. I joined Scott & White in 2005. Back in those days, the Round Rock campus didn't exist, and so I was working at the main campus up in Temple. Um, as soon as Scott & White announced that they were going to build the Round Rock campus, I raised my hand. I said, ooh, you know, pick me, pick me, because I actually lived here in Round Rock, and uh, just five minutes away. Just dumb luck, right? And so I was really the only one from the Temple campus that wanted to make the move, and it was a no-brainer. So as soon as they opened up our clinic, which was uh, October of 2006, I started the clinic up with 11 other physicians here, and then the hospital came online July 30th of 2007, not that anyone's counting. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so then I hired some more partners, and we've steadily grown neurology, and there's been some shrinkage, and now we're regrowing again and, and, and spreading and uh, trying to take over like the Ebola virus. Right, right. So, um, so I'm very interested. With better consequences, in, hopefully. Right, absolutely. Um, I helped us uh, to become the very first um, stroke-certified hospital in Williamson County. And I uh, look forward to uh, assisting with the stroke care um, going forward in the community. Well, I know I have to thank you because for a long time now, you've been the only name on uh, stroke coverage. So I'm seeing that you're getting some relief in. So thank you very much for, for covering for all that time. Absolutely. Well, why don't we start off, just explain to us the, the different types of stroke um, and what the general prevalence is of each of those. Sure. So the, the three main types of stroke are, number one, ischemic stroke, which is the most common. And ischemic strokes represent about 85% of all strokes. Okay. The second most common is an intracerebral hemorrhage, or we also call them intraparenchymal hemorrhages. And this is a hemorrhage within the substance of the brain itself. And then the least common type of stroke is the subarachnoid hemorrhage, which is hemorrhage within the subarachnoid space, the intraventricular cavity in the brain. In terms of numbers, there's 800,000 Americans that have a stroke every year. Um, of those 800,000, about a quarter of them are repeat offenders. These are people who have had a stroke in the past, and now they're coming in with their second lifetime stroke, third lifetime stroke, etc. But again, ischemic stroke represents the vast majority, 85% of all comers. So if you're a betting man, you had someone with stroke symptoms, odds are it's going to be ischemic. Odds are ischemic, 85% chance. Now, you mentioned repeat offenders. So when we're working up a patient, uh, I see them in the emergency department and say, yes, this person's had a stroke. We admit them. Um, what is the, the, if we're not going to give them TPA, let's say, and we admit them, what's the main point for the first stroke? What is it we're looking for? Okay, right. So there's, there's two concepts in terms of stroke prevention. So one concept is primary prevention, and that's the idea of preventing the stroke before it ever occurs, right? And that's what our primary care docs are doing out in the community in terms of managing blood pressure, cholesterol, diabetes, the common risk factors, smoking cessation, et cetera. And that's to prevent the event from occurring in the first place. So that's primary prevention. What you're talking about is secondary prevention. So Mrs. Jones is in the emergency department. She presents with signs and symptoms of stroke. Maybe it began yesterday, so she's outside the window for TPA. We're going to go ahead and admit her to so number one, take care of the current stroke that she's having, and number two is try to prevent another stroke from happening in the future. And um, would you like to? Yeah. So what are, so what are some of the main things that you're looking for there? Right. So the reason we put people in the hospital is because number one, um, we know that there are some critical things that should be done on all patients with stroke. So number one reduce the chance of them dying from that stroke immediately, and number two, reduce the chance of them having a recurrent stroke in the near future, within the next days, weeks, mm -hmm. months, et cetera. And so there's some very simple things that we can do now to give them the best odds. Right. And then number two, we're also looking at the long-term risk of trying to prevent recurrence. Okay. 
Okay. And those things really are best done in the hospital. And it's things like what we're going to do with the blood pressure, whether we're going to give them uh, an antiplatelet agent or an anticoagulant, um, whether we're going to get therapy involved, et cetera. And we can go into more of this sure. as you like. Okay. Yeah. Well, let's, let me ask you a few things about that. We, uh, we're going to talk about the acute interventions mm -hmm. for stroke a little bit more. But after that first 12 hours, let's say, whether we um, give lytics or not, what are some of the important interventions that we're doing in the hospital, the things that are really making a difference for patients? Okay. So let's start with blood pressure control, right? Okay. So let's say in this hypothetical case, mm -hmm. we didn't give Mrs. Jones uh, thrombolytic therapy because she presented outside the window for TPA. Sure. Our blood pressure guidelines for somebody with ischemic stroke is to let the blood pressure run high. Okay. How high? Up to 220 over 120. I know that sounds like a lot, but the issue is cerebral autoregulation. I'm not, I don't know mm -hmm. whether y'all are familiar sure. with that term or yeah. not, but the concept is this. In a normal, healthy individual, our brain, it's smart, right? And, and, uh, and it can tolerate a wide range of blood pressures from very low to very high. And across this wide range, your brain will maintain a constant cerebral blood flow, okay, from low pressure to high pressure. In someone who has chronic hypertension, that wide range gets shifted a little bit more to the right or to the high side. So people with chronic hypertension, they tend to tolerate even higher blood pressures better, lower blood pressures not so much. The way the brain does this is by auto-regulating what's going on in the um, vascular system. It can dilate the venous system and contract it. And that is an energy-dependent process, requires ATP for this to happen. Mm -hmm. In somebody who has acute ischemia, you lose that energy-dependent process and you lose this auto-regulation. And instead of being able to tolerate a wide range of blood pressures from a high to low, these folks purely depend on blood pressure to maintain cerebral blood flow. Okay, It becomes a linear event rather than sort of a flat horizontal mm -hmm. graph, okay? Um, so this is important for someone who's had a cardiac arrest, for example, and they're being resuscitated, and now we're going to put them on the cooling protocol. Mm -hmm. They have cerebral ischemia from the anoxic injury. These folks have disrupted cerebral autoregulation. They require much higher blood pressures to maintain cerebral blood flow than someone who doesn't have ischemia. Same thing with ischemic stroke. So that's why we let the blood pressure go up to 220 over 120, because these folks need blood pressure. The number one, the number one enemy of the patient with a, acute ischemic stroke is the brand new house officer that just graduated from medical school, right? Because this person's just graduated from medical school, they get called in the middle of the night by the nurse, and the nurse says, oh, we've got a blood pressure of 160 over 90, and uh, what do you want to do? And you know, they're sweating and everything. Clonidine, and it's like, clonidine. clonidine, right, yeah, well, that's good clonidine. And then, and then you, you drop the blood pressure, you drop the cerebral blood flow, and then that area of ischemic tissue now expands, right? And so you've expanded your stroke. So let the blood pressure run high. That is the number one thing that I have to emphasize. Let it run high, 220 over 120. So then the question is, is, well, when is it safe to bring it back down, right? The answer is after about a week. So we let the blood pressure take care of itself for up to a week. After about the one week mark, we will slowly reintroduce the blood pressure medicines. And the truth is, is that we're not the ones doing that because by then these patients have left the sure. hospital. So this is happening back in either rehab, if they go to rehab, SNF, um, or even back to primary care. And we'll put that in the discharge summary to slowly reintroduce the blood pressure medicines. The most commonly prescribed medicines are either ACE inhibitors, ARBs, or uh, thiazide diuretics. But really, whatever brings the blood pressure down slowly, delicately, over a period of time, is what's ideal. Key thing is the slow. Slow, slow, slow. Are there, with, uh, for example, like with congestive heart failure, there's some benefit to ACE inhibitors, maybe ARBs over uh, right. beta blockers uh, because of remodeling. Is there anything like that with stroke where there's it, one more than another? So in the stroke literature, it doesn't play out exactly. Okay. And it's, it's more about what is effective in the long run. And also keep in mind what people are going to be compliant with, right? Sure. Because if you look at if you look at medications that we prescribe, medications are only good as long as patients are taking them. And if we're prescribing 
expensive medications, medications that aren't on their drug formulary, medications that have a lot of side effects, medications that are taken three, four times a day. Right. Those are all things that are going to lead to non-compliance, medicines dropping off the list, and then we're not helping the patient. So we're looking for things that are cost-effective, easy to take, maybe once-a-day therapy that are going to stay on their med list. Okay. Well, very good. Well, let's switch while we're talking a little bit about sort of the physiology, what's going on in the brain. Um, I want to get to how do you recognize strokes, but I think maybe it might be useful to talk about the different types of strokes. So let's just say we're talking about ischemic strokes. Can you talk a little bit about um, the different types or distributions of strokes? So the types of symptoms you might see with the different strokes. Sure. So let's say you're riding in the ambulance, you're, you're going out to Mrs. Jones's house to pick her up, and, um, and you're trying to assess, you know, has she had a stroke in the field? What are the signs and symptoms you might be looking for? Well, the easiest thing to remember is, is the mnemonic FAST, F-A-S-T. And this is actually what we teach our patients who've had a stroke so that they can recognize signs and symptoms in the future. So I'll tell you what, the statistics are that less than 50% of patients who've had a stroke can name a single sign or symptom of stroke. And it's hard to believe. Someone who's been a stroke victim, less than 50% of them can actually name a single sign or symptom of stroke. So right now, there is a big active education campaign in this country. You might even see these commercials on television. It's FAST, F-A-S-T. The F stands for face. The idea is, if your face suddenly becomes paralyzed or drooping on one side, that is a sign or symptom of stroke. So when you're in the field, you want to examine the face. Have the patient smile, have them raise the eyebrows. Usually, strokes will cause lower facial weakness or a lower facial paralysis. In other words, when they raise the eyebrows, both of the eyebrows will raise symmetrically, okay? But the lower face will droop or be paralyzed on one side. Because if both the upper and lower face are affected, that's more commonly Bell's palsy, right? Which is a viral infection of the facial nerve, not a stroke. TPA doesn't help with TPA that? TPA doesn't help okay. with that. Probably won't hurt, but not going to help either. <laughs> um, so that's the F in FAST. The A stands for arm. So sudden arm paralysis, arm weakness, another common symptom of stroke. The S stands for speech. So if you all of a sudden have slurred speech and start talking like Nick Nolte on a Saturday <laughs> night, no offense to Nick Nolte, of course. <laughs> hope he's not watching this. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, that is a sign or symptom of stroke. Of course, you, you know you got to rule out you know, right. intoxication. There's right. some other things that the can common cause ways of slurred speech, speech, right? Right. And then the T, of course, stands for time. And and the right. idea is that we coach our patients that signs and symptoms of stroke, facial paralysis, arm weakness, speech disturbance, are all an emergency. The T stands for time. It's nine one one. We want patients to pick up the phone, call nine one one, and usually it's not the patient. It's somebody mm -hmm. else. It's the caregiver. It's, uh, it's, it's a bystander that witnesses it. Because most people that are having symptoms of stroke, number one, they don't recognize that they're having sure. a stroke. And number two, if they do feel like there's something wrong, they just kind of ignore it and say, well, I'll just sleep it off, you know. Because it doesn't hurt, right? right? Right. Like in contrast to a heart attack, MIs are horrible. I mean, this is horrible, substernal, crushing, chest pain, like, you know, some Godzilla thing just sat <laughs> on my chest, right? And strokes don't do that. Stroke, well, facial paralysis, arm weakness, yeah, you know, maybe I just slept the wrong way right. and my face and arm are suddenly paralyzed. You know, most people don't understand neuroanatomy, right. so anything's possible, yep. right? So anyway, 911. But that's what we're looking for is facial weakness, arm weakness, okay. slurred speech. Those are the most that's common, the most common symptoms. And our, so we use a LA pre-hospital stroke scale, which is geared very similar to that. Um, but that can obviously miss, the, the idea there is for specificity. We want to say if these things are positive, it is most likely to be a stroke. Obviously, that misses some strokes. So if you are, one of the big ones are the, the posterior circulation strokes, for example. So um, coordination. None of our stroke scales really address those very well. Can you address some of the signs and symptoms of those? Sure. So what we're talking about now is the difference between the anterior circulation, mm -hmm. which is what's supplied by the carotid arteries, versus the posterior circulation, which is sur supplied by the vertebral and, and basilar system. Mm -hmm. So the anterior circulation, um, you might get isolated leg weakness if it's an anterior cerebral artery territory stroke. So if you look at a, at a picture of the brain and what's known as the homunculus, which is like this little imaginary looking guy and 
what area of the brain controls what part of the body. You'll it's also see, a punk band, by the way. I was doing a search looking for a homunculus, a picture, and apparently it's a, a, a hardcore punk band. There's probably That's a great name. And there's probably a uh, inappropriate uh, yes, yes. video out there <laughs> associated with that. Yeah. So be careful what you search Correct. for. Correct. Right? Don't do it at work. Don't do it at work. So. So the, the anterior cerebral artery generally supplies sort of the, the middle kind of parasagittal front part of the brain, just right up here. It's a mm -hmm. small little strip. And that little strip is isolated or corresponds with the opposite leg. So right anterior cerebral artery, left leg, left anterior cerebral artery, right leg. And what it's going to cause is just isolated leg weakness. This is frontal lobe, which is motor, so it's not going to cause any sensory symptoms. This is a difficult stroke to detect because it just causes painless leg weakness. Most of these patients aren't going to recognize it as a sign or symptom of stroke. Mm. The vast majority are not going to come in with the, within the window for IV TPA therapy. So it's unlikely that, that you're going to see this, that, that our paramedics are going to see this in the field. But you're right, it, it's out there and it would be missed by mm -hmm. the, the scale that you're talking right. about. Um, the middle cerebral artery is, is an artery that comes off of the, uh, the internal carotid inside the brain, and it supplies the vast majority of blood flow to, to the entire half of your brain, okay? If it's the left middle cerebral artery, for most of us, this is going to affect language function. So a sign of ischemia or infarction is going to be aphasia. Aphasia is a problem with language. Aphasia is not mechanical. It's not slurred speech. But it's a language problem, like, for example, I might ask the patient, you know, what is this that I'm showing you? And instead of saying necktie, they might say sparkles, or they might say, rrr, rrr. I mean, right, they, they might make up their own word, like a bushism or something. Right. Right? Um, but aphasia is a language disorder. It's a problem with naming items, with finding the right word that you want to say, with using the wrong word or a word that is similar in sound. Um, in context, but not the right one. So that's what aphasia is, and that's left middle cerebral artery. Of course, this is also going to wipe out the motor symptoms um, on the opposite side of the body. So you're going to have face weakness, arm weakness, um, a lot of numbness, tingling, etc. if it's parietal in nature. If it's right middle cerebral, you'll often get neglect. And neglect is where you tend to ignore what's happening on the other side of your world. Um, in extreme examples, patients will deny that the left side of their body is theirs. And so, I mean, I've seen patients in the hospital with a right MCA stroke who have a paralysis here on the left arm, and I might hold up their left arm and say, Dr. Jarvis, you know, whose arm is this? And, uh, and they'll say, it's my arm. And, 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 and then I'll say, well, like, well, whose thumb is this? And they'll say, well, it's mine. And they won't recognize that it's theirs. Why are you putting this useless limb in front of me? Right. And sometimes they'll even, they'll even try to pick it up with their good arm and they'll throw it out of bed <laughs> thinking that it belongs to someone else. So right. that's an example of neglect. And it can be, it can be um, a visual neglect where you attend to things in your visual world, world on one side, but you just don't see anything going on on the opposite side, um, which is a visual type of neglect, or it can be more of a, um, more of a motor neglect as, as well. Um, Almost now, like a neurologist could write a great series of books about patients with strokes. I think that's been done, as a matter oh, of fact. Right. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Now, yeah. Now, in contrast, the posterior circulation is going to get your occipital lobes, right? Occipital lobe is responsible for vision. Specifically, it's responsible for the um, peripheral vision, okay? And 
For example, somebody with a right occipital stroke will have a left homonymous hemianopsia or a left visual field deficit. And the only way you're going to detect this is if you're doing some visual field assessment. Um, the way we do it is we have the patient cover one eye. Can we do a demonstration? Sure. So go ahead and cover, cover your right eye with your right hand, for example. Okay. And we're going to try to get on the same level so that my eye and his eye are about the same. I'll try to turn around this way so they can see me a little better. Okay. There you go. So I'm going to have you look right here at my eye. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to check your visual fields up okay. here in these two upper quadrants okay. and then down here in these lower quadrants. Okay. And I'm going to cover up my eye as well so that way we're both just using one eye. And the idea is, and I just make it simple. I say, do you see one or do you see two fingers in the periphery? So looking here, do you see one or two fingers? One. Okay. One or two. One. Yeah. One or two. Two. Yeah. One or two. Two. Good. It's that easy. And then would you repeat that on the other side? That takes 10 seconds to do, and that will assess for a visual field deficit. So again, if it's right occipital, it's going to be a left hemifield cut. If it's left occipital, it's going to be a right hemifield cut, which means that when we're doing that, you're only going to see the one or two on the one side from both eyes. So the right fields from both eyes or the left fields from both eyes. The others, there's just, there's just blackness out there. I give you an interesting story. So, when I was a uh, when I was a resident, I got called in the middle of the night. This is when you know you, you lived in the hospital, right? This is back in the old days when I was trained, and uh, I got called by the ER, and they said, "Well, we got this so little all good stories again, right?" They all do the <laughs> ER. Got this little old lady, and she's she's confused. She's confused, and Q uh, Don said, so, "Okay, sure." So I come down there, and you start with just the interview, you know, how are you doing, or whatever, and we're having a casual conversation, and she's spot on the money. She tells me her name, her date of birth, her age, where she's at, et cetera, and, and just in the conversation, I'm not picking up any confusion here, right? Right. And so then I get to the, so then I'm interested, well, why did somebody think you were confused? Right. The story is, is uh, when she was trying to walk through the doorway, she kept on running into the wall. And that, she couldn't go through the doorway, right? And it was always the same side. It was like she'd always hit the left side of the door, the door frame, and not make it through the door. And that's why she was, quote, confused. Well, it hmm. turns out, when I examined her, she had a left visual field deficit. She didn't see anything over there. That's why she kept on running this stuff. So she wasn't confused. Right. It was a left visual field deficit. Um, I've seen patients have motor vehicle accidents as their presenting symptom of a visual field deficit due to stroke because they're driving along and all of a sudden they lose this peripheral visual field on one side. They don't see what's coming over there and boom, they get hit and, uh, and they end up in the emergency room and everything is being checked out. It turns out they've got this little visual field deficit right. and it's, it's from a stroke. So that's going to be missed with the... Um, Those classic stroke skills. Right, right. And then, of course, the other posterior circulation is going to be brainstem. Okay, so medulla... Um, midbrain, pons, and this is all of the vital stuff that uh, that we don't have a whole lot of mental control over, like level of consciousness. So these patients generally are going to present with sudden onset of coma, severe dysarthria, maybe inability to um, swallow. This is where you're going to run into all the airway issues and protection. Um, these folks, um, generally, generally these are the most devastating strokes of the are the posterior circulation that affect the brainstem, um, and, and those are the highest risk mortality, right? They, they, they present as acute onset, coma, and, and really right. catastrophe. So let's talk about the altered mental status a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, we see a lot of patients, Williams County is an older population, so we see a lot of uh, patients with altered mental status. How often do you see altered mental status as the primary symptom in a stroke? Almost never. Almost never. Um, so in, in neurology, we always think of what are called neighborhood symptoms, right? Mm -hmm. In other words, each area of your brain is responsible for carrying out a different function. And the, the area of your brain that would create a mental status problem um, is, is so small um, that to have a stroke that just hits that area that doesn't affect anything else, that doesn't cause paralysis of the arm or facial paralysis or blindness or a sudden ataxia, um, problem with coordination, is infinitesimally 
rare. Yes, I've seen it, but um, when somebody shows up with acute onset ultra dental status, ischemic stroke should be like the last thing mm -hmm. on the differential. So exceptionally rare. Yeah. So if you were to say have a patient from a nursing home, elderly, normally sharp lady, uh, just happens to oh I don't know be confused and gradual onset of confusion and oh I don't know maybe it smells like urine and it's 105 temperature, probably not an ischemic stroke. Probably not an okay. ischemic stroke. Correct. Uh, right. So you know you look for the usual suspects: urinary tract infections, right. in that case, yeah. pneumonia. Um, yeah, maybe a little little dementia that's been brewing there in right. the background. But chances it changed are, since last Christmas, the last time the family saw it. Yes. Well, speaking of uh, differential diagnoses, we're talking, let's take a, um, just your classic strokes, not, not the, uh, the rare ones, but for your classic strokes, what are the classic differentials that we need to consider, uh, the things that we can test for in the, in the field? So, I guess in terms of like whether it's a stroke or whether it's not like a, a stroke? Like a mimic, yeah. So stroke mimics, right. So I would say that the big, the big ones are going to be TIA, which is basically a stroke that resolves itself technically within 24 hours. And if you do all the neuroimaging studies, there's no evidence of an infarction there. Mm -hmm. So it's basically the beginning stage of a stroke. So TIA, stroke, seizure is another big mimic. Um, you know, most seizures are not convulsive in nature. Most seizures do not cause sudden loss of consciousness and generalized mm -hmm. convulsive activity. Most seizures cause sort of a staring unresponsiveness, altered mental status, mm -hmm. okay? Um, you can have what's called a postictal paralysis. So after the seizure, you can be weak on one side. Um, Might be a good reason to exclude patients with recent seizures from stroke scales. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay. Um, migraine, believe it or not, is another common mimic of, uh, of strokes. As a matter of fact, there's a woman, her name is Serene Branson, B-R-A-N-S-O-N, Serene Branson. She was reporting live at the Grammy Awards, um, it might have been two or three years ago, and all of a sudden, live on national television, well, a very, very heavy, uh, heavy divertation tonight. We had a very Darison by, let's go to Terrace Terrace and let's go to the bit, the head of the pit. Turns out she was having a migraine now. I mean, it looked like she might have been having a stroke at the time because the symptom that she was displaying was aphasia, again, right. this language problem. But uh, then she had a severe headache later on that came. But the visual field thing that I was talking about, that can be a scotoma, visually, a, a scintillating scotoma from a migraine. Um, usually migraine symptoms, the neurologic stuff like visual field or aphasia, even numbness or tingling, usually last about 30 minutes, maximum an hour, and then resolve, and then headache comes. But not always. Not all migraineurs have headaches. But that's so just a, like that, the seizure without the active signs, right. you can have migraines without headaches. But those it doesn't the, seem very fair, does it? Right. Well, you know, would you, would you rather have a headache right, exactly. or, or would you not rather have a headache? <laughs> right. Right. But those are the big mimics. Those okay. are the big mimics. Or it's going to be a TIA, which we're going to, you know, which we are concerned about, mm -hmm. um, a seizure or a migraine. Those are the big ones. Okay. Maybe hypoglycemia. Hypoglycemia is another good one. Right. So someone with very, very low blood sugar can present with focal neurologic signs, believe it or not. And the flip side of that, hyperglycemia, mm -hmm. sugars greater than 400, can present the same way. So that's another... Um, actually, it's an exclusionary criteria for giving somebody TPA um, because a lot of those patients end up, they're not having an acute stroke and they just have a sugar problem. Right. Yeah. And the good news is that a, an ischemic stroke probably isn't going to resolve with D50. This is true. Okay. This is true. Last I checked. Um, so you had mentioned uh, one thing about TIAs. You said technically within 24 hours. Right. So the target for sort of the definition for how long a TIA should last seems to have been moving. What's the, what's the latest definition? Well, I mean, the, you know, the technical definition is symptoms lasting less than 24 hours. That is the technical definition. Really, most, most people that have a TIA, their symptoms last 30 to 60 minutes, um, and that's about it, most of them. So if you're having symptoms for more than 60 minutes, that's going to be a stroke. Um, if you're having symptoms less than 30 minutes, 
there's a good chance that it might be a migraine or a seizure or even an electrolyte issue, a vitamin B12 deficiency, and then there's some other things out there as well. Uh, and you can have a TIA that lasts five or ten minutes. It's possible. Um, not, not too common, though. All right. Okay. Very good. Um, let's talk about, uh, let's break up basically ischemic strokes and bleeds and talk okay. about the, the interventions sure. that are appropriate for them. So let's go with ischemic strokes first since that's the majority of them. What are the key things that need to be done early, and what are our time limits for what early is? Okay, sure. So ischemic stroke, number one, again, we're going to let the blood pressure run high, 220 over 120. So step away from the clonidine. Um, if the patient's on antihypertensives, which a lot of, a lot of our patients are, we're actually going to either discontinue them or we're going to cut down on the doses to allow their blood pressure to run high. So that's number one. Okay. Number two is we're going to initiate some sort of uh, either antiplatelet therapy or anticoagulation therapy. For the vast majority of patients, it's going to be aspirin. Go to a little aspirin, 325 milligrams a day. Um, why? Because it's been studied over and over again and has shown to reduce mortality, um, increase the chance of going home to live independently, and reduce the chance of stroke recurrence if given within the first 48 hours, within the first 48 hours of a stroke. And I, I put the emphasis on 48 hours because what that means is that when you're out in the field, unlike an MI, it is not important to give an aspirin to Mrs. Jones and have her chew it up and swallow it. Well, it's so just what, an aspirin. What could be wrong with that? She might have a bleed, oh, right? You don't know. When you're, unless you've got a CAT scan like in your back pocket or something. Right. I don't know if they're making them that small these days or not. Uh. Uh, Fortunately, no. When you're in the field, you can't tell whether someone has an ischemic stroke or a hemorrhagic stroke. And what you don't want to do is give the ischemic stroke patient something that's going to thin their blood unnecessarily, right. like aspirin. So it, do okay. not give them an aspirin in the field when you suspect a stroke. We're going to come in. We're going to do the evaluation. CAT scan is going to be the first thing that they're going to get in the ED to determine bleed or no bleed. And uh, assuming that there's not a bleed... We've got 48 hours to get them the aspirin. I mean, we're going to get them the aspirin that day. We're not going to delay it unless they've got a problem with swelling, in which case right. it's going to go up the other end of their body. But so there's not a huge clock going tick. tick no, no, tick. no, 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 no. We don't. We don't have a ticking time bomb on getting somebody aspirin. Well, I okay. do hear a ticking sound. What's that ticking sound coming from? So there is a time dependent thing. I mean, we're really pressed on time for ischemic strokes. What are we looking for? Oh, you're talking about whether we're going to get them TPA yeah, or not. Yeah. Right. Right. Absolutely. So. Right, so somebody presents within a short window of time, we have an opportunity to give them intravenous, IV, thrombolytic therapy, good old-fashioned TPA, Ultiplace, okay? We're not doing that fancy, new-founded stuff, what is it, TNK or whatever, mm -hmm. none, of that, none of that for, for stroke. Um, those cardiology yeah, guys. Yeah, the cardiology, those, those guys are cowboys, you know, we, we don't, <laughs> we're just country neurologists here, we don't, we don't right. do any of that stuff, so it's just good old-fashioned TPA, Ultiplace. And the old guideline was a zero to three hour window, a zero to three hour window of onset of stroke symptoms. Um, for most of our patients, that window has been expanded now to four and a half hours. There are some people that the old three hour window still applies. Um, the, main, the main people that, that don't get to go to four and a half hours are going to be people that are older. So 80 and up, they're still um, three hours or less. There's some other, one, other factors in there, but Four and a half hours, if, if everyone can remember four and a half hours, then then that's great because it increases the chance of getting them in here quickly, mm -hmm. the clock is running, and being able to get them IV TPA if they're within that window. So that's really the time-dependent issue. The thing we've got to get them in quickly is for the evaluation whether they need TPA or not. Right. Uh, and and the, most, the most important thing in determining that is when were they last known normal, mm -hmm. right? Because... You know, it's, it's pretty rare when a stroke is witnessed, right? We're having lunch together, and all of a sudden I see you drop your fork, and your face becomes paralyzed, and I say, Aha! Right. Dr. Jarvis is having a stroke at uh -huh. uh, 12.51 p.m. Right. on oh, nice. August the 1st, right? Well, you write that down in case someone asks yeah, me. Yeah, you know, that's just, generally speaking, doesn't happen. Right. So, uh, usually we're trying to, to backtrack and say, well, when was the last time that you were normal? And, um, and it might have been when, uh, when you took the dog out for a walk this morning, or if it's, uh, if it's somebody that woke, up in the mil in, that woke up in the morning and they woke up with stroke symptoms, 
Well, when were they last known normal? Were they last known normal at 10 o'clock at night when they went to bed? Did they get up to go to the bathroom at 3 a.m.? And so that's the information that we're looking for is when were you last known normal? That's when we start the clock. So four and a half hours from that time. Critical to establish. Very good. So that's the key thing for ischemic strokes. What about right. for hemorrhagic strokes? So for hemorrhagic strokes, um, the, the number one issue is, is that these can go bad in terms of development of coma. Um, so this is where your ABCs are going to come into play, airway protection, et cetera. That's, that is the critical thing with these folks. Um, it's not so much time sensitive. It's not like the TPA patients mm -hmm. where... We've got to jump on it and do something about it right now because there's not, for most of these patients, there's not a whole lot that's going to be done acutely other than just bring their blood pressure down. So in contrast to the ischemic patient where we let the blood pressure run high, for the, for the hemorrhagic stroke, we, we, we do turn up, the, turn up the blood pressure medicines right. and bring it down. And we want generally 160 for a systolic or less. Um, depending on the location and the amount of bleeding, a small, small percentage of these patients are going to be eligible for some sort of neurosurgical intervention, uh, whether that's a ventriculostomy, mm -hmm. um, intracranial pressure monitoring, um, a clot extraction. I mean, this, this stuff is not done commonly. It is a small, small percentage of bleeds that go on to have these things mm -hmm. done. So um, that's not really where our emphasis should be. Our emphasis should be on trying to identify ischemic strokes and get them in here within that zero to four and a half hour window and get them treated quickly. Very good. Well, I want to just rehash one thing about that. So we have primary stroke centers and mm -hmm. comprehensive stroke centers. Can you tell us just real briefly what the difference between them is? Hmm. Do you know the difference between primary <laughs> exactly. and comprehensive? <laughs> I, 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 well, in I terms think, of like say, I think the comprehensive ones are the ones that that do more of the interventional things, like the Mercy Retrieval device. Right. So this is this device where the uh, the interventional radiologist will you know will cowboy it up the up the groin and you know up right. into the brain and grab the clot right. and they put this little umbrella thing in there so that when they grab the clot it doesn't break up and and flow north and cause more right. devastation and and. Uh, and have outcomes exactly identical to TPA. Yeah. So <laughs> I kind of refer to this stuff as cowboy medicine because um, a lot of it was being done with good intention. Mm -hmm. This clot retrieval, um, intra-arterial TPA, sure. where instead of going the IV route, which we have very good data going back to the 1990s that this stuff works, instead going through the groin and just squirting the TPA right up into that internal carotid or right into the MCA itself. Seems like it should work. Seems like it should work. Uh, it turns out that, that these advanced interventions, et cetera, they don't. Right. They don't. Uh, they're, they're no better or even potentially worse than the good old-fashioned IVTPA. So IVTPA is the standard. All this cowboy medicine, mercy retrieval device, et cetera, mm -hmm. has really fallen out of favor now. Um, and it's really only being done in... Um, controlled research academic situations, centers. academic centers, sure. right? And I think that's that's the distinction that you're talking about between right. primary stroke center versus mm -hmm. comprehensive. Comprehensive doing more of the cowboy stuff, which at this point in time, 2014, really should just be clinical studies and not just right. you know freewheeling it and you know rolling the dice. So I think for for us in the field, when we can't tell um, the difference between an ischemic stroke and a hemorrhagic stroke. Um, they're outside of the subarachnoid, walking along fine, worst headache of your life, plop, right. unconscious. Right. Um, outside of that, which really isn't all that common, we have to assume the default has to be it's an ischemic stroke, get them to a primer where we can make the decision on TPA. Or Absolutely. It, it would really be a travesty to, to take someone presenting with acute signs and symptoms of stroke and send them, you know, 70 miles on down the road or whatever to try to get right. them to a comprehensive center when they could have just gone five miles down the road and gotten treated, you know, within five minutes or so. Yeah, no, we, we really want these folks going to primary stroke centers. That's right. where they're going to receive their care. Perfect. And even if ultimately they get transferred uh, from the ED to another center, that still doesn't mean that that was the wrong choice. 
for the initial therapy. They, Correct. That they got what they needed early on. Correct. Okay. Very good. Um, let's shift gears a little bit because I know you probably have patients waiting for you, so we'll uh, get you back. We see seizures a lot, mm -hmm. and sometimes they're not really seizures. Um, any just quick tips, pearls on? Well, they're not called pseudo seizures anymore. Oh yeah, they are. But, I call them uh, pseudo seizures. So you don't like the new acronym? No, the non-epileptic, oh. uh, whatever, like yada yada. No, it I sounds like an anatomical description. Right. No, I still call them pseudo seizures. Right. So, yeah. So okay. So a couple of key points in differentiating mm -hmm. someone with epileptic seizures versus right. pseudo seizures, or you know, sort of psychological, kind of a panic attack of the brain, if right. you will. Um, like most people that have epileptic seizures. Um, when they're having their seizure, their eyes are open, believe it or not, their eyes are open. If you see someone who's having an event, a spell, if you will, and their eyes are closed, that's usually a pseudo seizure. Eyes closed, pseudo, eyes open, epileptic. Okay. That's one. Another one is how quickly are they moving their head? So if somebody is having a true epileptic seizure and they're moving their head, it's usually going to be a slow head turn to one side, usually the eyes and the head go one real slow, okay? If someone's doing this kind of thing, head going back and forth, mm, pseudo seizure, all right? The next thing is, uh, let's say the convulsive part of it. Somebody who's having an epileptic seizure, if they're having a convulsion, usually the tonic phase, the arms are going to extend tonically, the legs might go also, and they kind of rhythmically convulse and jerk together. If you see somebody who's doing like this, or doing like this, or the legs are bicycling, pseudo seizure. Not so much. Yeah, not so much. Crying, okay? Most epileptic patients that have a seizure do not cry. If you see crying, there is no crying in right. seizures, okay? That is a pseudo seizure. <laughs> crying is a telltale symptom of pseudo yeah. seizure. Sounds Absolutely. like there should be a Jeff Foxworthy thing in here. It might be a pseudo seizure if... I might have it. Maybe this is a career opportunity there you for go. me, you know, yeah. if, this, if this gig doesn't work out. I like it. Yeah. I like it. Very good. Well, outstanding. I uh, I know your your time is uh, short and you need to get back. So I really, really appreciate you coming and talking with us. So I enjoyed it. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thanks, y'all. Thanks. Thanks.